Um, I would like to start my keynote. Now, I can't really start the keynote. I actually have to make a brief announcement myself. You see, uh, some people think that uh, when you use swear words, it basically means that your intelligence is low, actually true in my case, that you're not, you don't have a, a rich vocabulary, also true in my case, but that it actually also means something else, and, and, or maybe just that. And I use uh, a lot of foul language, and I use it because I associate it with how I feel. It's whether I'm angry, whether I'm excited, whether I'm frustrated, and I tend to use swear words. And, you know, I, I don't mean to offend anyone, I just want to say up front. And, of course, if you are offended merely by me using words like shit, then, you know, honestly, I truly am fucking sorry. <laughs> now, on to the joy in what we do. So, I was asked to write a description for this. And I know that none of the attendees actually read the descriptions that, that people write down. I will share this description with you. It is a poem I wrote. Small memories flooding our consciousness like a river of delightful experiences, carrying us through our lives, tugging at our hearts, pointing us towards endless appreciation of what many fall prey to forgetting. Our love of solving puzzles and our joy of transforming reality and life itself. And I hope that by the end of this keynote, you will understand what I mean by these words. Now, every keynote has a story. Mine does too. It all started with John. Now, John, it, wait, John, oh, there we go. John, uh, this is John Anderson, a co-organizer of Yap CNA, along with Chris Prather, Peregrine, and uh, a few volunteers. And, I actually have a few pictures of John. Um, you could actually see him. If you search Google Images for scary man, he makes an appearance. You can see that the in colors between the beard and, and cap are inverted. Um, uh, he also makes an appearance in other places. This is him with some anonymous random dude. Um, when, I, when you ask John to stop tweeting stupid pictures of his food, and of course, uh, with his dog Sammy doing, I, actually, I don't want to know what. But John gives fantastic talks, and in one of his talks, he mentioned a band that he really likes called The Hold Steady. And they have something at their shows that he mentioned, which is they pause and tell their audience there is so much joy in what we do up here. And I felt like this really resonates with me. And I thought, you know, if I ever get to do a keynote, which I never will, I will name it the joy in what we do. And later, John actually asked me to do a keynote, which just goes to show you how fucking smart John is, which is not very. Of course, I immediately agreed, which goes to show you how fucking smart I am, which is not much more. Now, um, when I thought about this, and I thought, well, what is the joy in what we do? I was flooded with a lot of memories. All these small bits of experiences and when those were rushing to my consciousness, I was thinking about this, and those of you that know me personally, you know that I'm actually very private. Um, I don't know how many of you know this, but X is not my actual birth family name. It, I know. Um, but I decided to share some of these experiences with you. One of those was Winuke. When you sent um, a, a ma malicious packet in Windows, it would crash the entire operating system. And one of the first programs I wrote was actually an implementation of Winuke. When Winuke came out, our computer classes were basically reduced to Winuking each other over the net. You spend the majority of the time trying to figure out what is the IP of the person next to you so you could crash his computer. And that's what we did all day long. <laughs> I remember when Netbus came out, it was the first very successful, let's see if this works, First, very successful Trojan horse. And you could do a lot of really cool stuff with it. So you can redirect the ports and apps, and you can change the mouse position, swap them and show images on screen, get info and active windows, send text, get a screen dump, a lot of stuff. Basically, we did this. Let me see. There we go. That's what we did. <laughs> we thought that this is the funniest shit in the world. It turns out we were right. Now, 
um, I actually did other stuff with this. I actually used the different ab abilities to get people's passwords. Now, I didn't do anything with those passwords, but I just collected them. I thought it was kind of interesting, and I got them. It was through the registry or applications, key loggers, whatever. And uh, a friend of mine actually used one of those. Eventually, someone called him up and said, look, I can see your uh, phone number calling using my um, my uh, credential, so I want you to pay me back for this. And that was the first time I was banned on his computer when he is away. Um, now, um, this is something very small, but to me it was very significant. I got to work with CSV files. CSV files stand for comma-separated files, but I didn't know this. I just knew that it had a bunch of files that have values, and those values separated by commas. That was it. And I, I tried to use um, different applications, and eventually I resulted to um, using C to parse this myself. Now, I didn't know shit is right. I didn't know Perl back then, and my C was terrible, so I couldn't write something as sophisticated as text CSV access. But it did allow me to not use this piece of shit that I hated so much. And to me, that was a great experience. As a kid, I was writing a parser for CSV, and I was able to avoid using a massive application the entire company wrote. And that was an incredible experience, filling me with a lot of these feelings of accomplishment for like, parsing files. Diablo came out. Diablo was one of my favorite games. Um, the shareware had two levels, if I recall correctly. I played it for like 30 times straight, and then we bought the game, we played it. And the thing is that we... we <clears throat> We were still in school, and there was a rumor at my school that a few kids actually broke into school to play Diablo online so they can have faster internet. Of course, I can't divulge any more information because I, I honestly don't know. I was definitely not one of those kids. But if you want more details, you can talk to me after the talk. The, um, at some point, I started learning assembly. And when you start with assembly, I don't know how many of you um, tried assembly, no assembly. Basically, you're thinking, I have no fucking idea what I'm doing. None at all. But then after a while, it starts looking like this, where you have some, some concept of like, okay, okay, I'm getting this. This is not bad. I can understand it. You know, there are blocks, and it makes sense, and there are jumps, and it's all like, you know, it's structured, it's nice. And the interesting part is when you realize that you can take any binary and disassemble it to assembly code, which is machine code. So you can do that. Well, it's not machine code, but it really is the closest thing. So the operating system can translate it to you know, everything that, that, that you can see in assembly. Now, the way that, that conditions actually work is that eventually they get into the, place, to, um, the code in the machine, the operating system, where it compares two values, and if they match something, they will, uh, the machine will run a piece of code by a label. And if it didn't, they will go to a different piece of code. So it's just jumping around after comparing things. And then you go, wait, but if I have an, a hex editor, I can change that instruction. So suddenly when it compares two values, if it's greater, uh-uh, only if it's lower. I want you to jump. So suddenly when I have an application that says, well, um, did your serial number match the, um, the requirement? Oh, it, it didn't. Well, it works. Enjoy. Um, or you could actually do another thing, which is just no opping it. You can say, well, just disable this piece of operation. So it's, I'm going to check your password. No, you won't. You're going to let me continue playing. So when you realize you can crack applications and games, this becomes your life. Second. <sighs> Better. Okay. So um, I started cracking applications and games. And, um, you know, I wasn't always successful. Uh, sometimes I was successful, sometimes I wasn't, but it was always a lot of fun. One really interesting example is Cubase. Cubase is a very successful audio processing software. And um, one of the later versions, when they finally cracked it, um, they realized that the cracked version was faster. Wait, why was it faster? Well, it was faster because the Cubase program basically did a ton of checks all the time to make sure it's a legal copy. So the cracked version just disabled those checks. The situation that happened is that people bought Cubase and cracked it. <laughs> they bought Cubase and then downloaded the cracked version. And this taught me a very important lesson. First of all, Maybe treating your customers as potential criminals is not a good business decision. Just saying, maybe. Uh, second thing I learned, you should crack your software. It might run better. 
Third thing I learned is that maybe we should use applications that don't think of us as criminals, like free software, like open source stuff. It doesn't mean that you won't, yes. Yeah, it, it doesn't mean that you won't pay for it. Paying for it is a completely different thing. But it means that when you get it, you get the entire application and you're not in a struggle with it over trust issues. It's yours, you own it, and you're done. Um, one of the biggest things I remember at Pearl is that it helped me um, find a place to live. So I moved to Tel Aviv at a very young age. What you're seeing in front of you is the Tel Aviv coastline. And it is very, very, very dense. Now, um, when I moved to Tel Aviv, I got a new job. And this new job did not allow me to now seek an apartment for two, three weeks. And the way that it works in Tel Aviv is that we have a website, actually, now there are two, that allow you to look for apartments. It's just an apartment listing. Everyone can post, post there, and anyone can read it. You don't have to pay. There's no subscription. But if you're a landlord and you want your results to be at the top, you pay extra. So what we usually did was just check the apartment um, listing every single day. Once every few days, an apartment would show up. But you had to check it every single day, multiple times a day, because as soon as an apartment got up there, someone had already called them up, saw the apartment. Sometimes they would ask to rent it right there in the spot and just even sign the contract. It is crazy, and it just got worse. And um, what happened was that you would just have to sit on the website and just refresh every, you know, every half an hour, which means you need to take days off. And if it will be posted once, a week, something that matters to you, we'd have to take at least a week to see one apartment. So the first thing I did when I moved there was to write a Perl script, one of my first Perl scripts, that scanned the website and filtered it according to um, the number of rooms, the size of the apartment, the location, whether it had pictures, the price, all of these things. And it sent me an email. Now, it would run in a cron every single minute. Now, my email program would notify me with a sound alert saying, hey, there's an apartment for you to check. So I would check my email and see the pictures and decide whether I wanted to call them or not. So I would get an email once, maybe twice a week, but it didn't have to be, like I didn't have to check the website all the time. So I, was just, I just had to be near the computer at work, which is kind of easy when this is what you do. So uh, what happened was that um, I would call people up sometimes 10 or 20 seconds after they posted because the script ran. And I was next to the computer, I see the apartment, I'm like, okay, this is cool, and I make a phone call. So you would get situations, they press a button, and then five, four, three, and I call them up. Hi, I saw that you just posted, <laughs> and I was wondering if I could, and let me tell you this, you have never, ever heard someone so fucking scared of the internet. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I made a few people swear off computers for a while. But you know, the market was hard and you know, places to live, so it, it worked. I remember the first time I contacted a sleeping author. Um, I saw in a module, I started using modules, I started looking into CPAN, and started looking at the source of modules, and I saw an eval in the version. I had no idea what that meant, so I emailed the author. The author was Dave Rolski. I know, but he did answer the email. It was very pleasant. He explained it. And he said, well, this is why I do it, and this is the problem, and this is how we solve it. And this was my first interaction with this person. And it's, it, it was kind of terrifying because this is a, um, an individual that sat down and wrote a piece of software, um, not as part of some contract that I have with him, not as something he owes me. And he, I, I emailed him personally, and he replied back with an entire explanation. It was my first interaction with a CPAN author. It was a fantastic experience. We became friends soon after. I remember when I went on IRC, IRC Pearl Org. I went on the Poe channel, and I asked some help in Poe. Poe is an event-based system. It is very cool. And for some reason, when I tried to learn it, it just it didn't click. Sometimes it doesn't click. And, well, for me often, but still. Um, so. I went on the IRC channel and I asked them for some help. And they were very helpful. So they sat down with me, tried to explain everything. Well, this is how this works, this is how this works. How about you try doing this, try doing that. And it didn't click, nothing helped. After a while, someone else came on the channel and said, you know what, just stop everything you're doing right now. Could you explain to me from the top, please, what you're trying to do? Said, okay, try again. And um, it's always useful to go along with something someone tries to get you to do when they're helping you because maybe they know how to approach the topic. And he actually sat down with me for a half an hour to an hour and explained everything. And I understood it. And I was so excited by this 
And again, an anonymous person, I am an anonymous person to him, he is anonymous to me, and he just helped me out. And I don't do this, I really don't, but this time I Googled him. And I found out that it was Rocco Caputo, who, <laughs> for those that are not laughing, this is the guy who fucking wrote Poe. This is a person who wrote a very complicated, very elaborate piece of software. He wrote all the guides, testing, documentation, um, tutorials, uh, articles. He wrote everything. He wrote plugins, servers, clients, everything. And he still found the time to sit with some anonymous person online for close to an hour to explain how it works. And that was an amazing experience for me. Now, for people here who have released software on CPAN, I don't know how many of you remember the first time you yourselves contacted a CPAN author. But I think that for all of us, this is a really good opportunity to get our community to become much closer. And if you recall a good opportunity, a good, a good um, experience, I think that is the experience that you should give the next person who contacts you. If you recall a bad experience, Try to think of the experience you would have liked to experience. And if you haven't ever contacted a CPAN author, I wholeheartedly recommend it. Please, we are here, we are a community. So just talk to us, shoot us an email. Say thanks. You're welcome to also say thanks. I remember when I submitted my first bug report, I don't know how many of you do. How many of you remember your first bug report? Not bad, not bad. Usually I get zero. So I remember my first bug report. I started with this book, I started with Catalyst. This is called Accelerating uh, Pro Web Application Development. It, it's by J Rock, Jonathan Rockway. And um, I started with this book and, and one of the, the early examples, there was two, two plugins for Catalyst. So I tried them and accidentally, I actually put them in the wrong use order and it failed. And nowadays I would probably be able to debug this, but I didn't at the time. So I opened the bug report saying, I'm using these plugins and I, it, there's an error. And after a while I got a response back and the response was actually by Yuval Kojman, who some of you might know or heard of. And I was very excited because this person is one of the smartest developers we ever had in our community. He's brilliant. Um, he worked on Moose and on Catalyst. He wrote KyokuDB, Search Gen, and a lot of other cool stuff. And I was very excited. I actually got to meet him when I started organizing Tel Aviv PM. But until then, I didn't know him. I did. I didn't know of him. And I got the reply back from rtcpan.org, it was an email, and then I saw my email and made sure that, that it didn't make any spelling errors and that, I, that it was understood. And then I read his response. I was like, oh my God, this is Yuval's email, it's, it's, it's response, and I'm, it, my first book report, he basically said, I'm not gonna fix it, and he closed it. <laughs> I, well, what he said was, you know, th these plugins actually do some really weird stuff and you should not have been using them. I don't even know how they got in the book. So, so it, it made a point, and um, Yuval, if you are listening, we miss you very much, please come back, and, and please, when you come back, bring with you the book that you borrowed from me, I want it back, uh, my Donnie Darko book, I, I love it, and I want it. Now, um, my first Yapsi ever was in Italy. Um, it was Yapsi EU 2010. Um, sorry? Pisa, yes. And um, I, I'm, I'm really happy that I got to attend a bunch of these Yapsies in the uh, Eastern part of Europe. It's fantastic, I'm enjoying it so much. I get to uh, go to a lot of these cool places like Bulgaria. And my first one was actually Italy. And um, I, I, you know, I, I got there actually from attending the ProMongers meetings in Tel Aviv. It was 0 p.m. and I started attending those. And I, at first when I attended ProMongers, let me tell you, I was scared shitless. Okay, these people, they knew what they were talking about. I, I you know, I could barely know, I, I barely knew my own name. Now, given that didn't change very much for me, they still knew what they were talking about. And that was, that was really scary for me. And I met Gabo Sabo, um, who many of you know for his massive contribution to the Pearl community and to, uh, in general, to Pearl. And he convinced me to actually go to Yapsi. I was like, what do you mean, Yapsi? He was like, yeah, go to Yapsi. Why not? It's like, are you nuts? I was like, maybe, but go, who cares? <laughs> and, and he convinced me, and this is why I'm here. I am here because of him. And he went one step further, which was even weirder. He said, 
you should give a talk. I said, give a talk? What the hell would I talk about? He said, well, you've been doing some stuff with Android. You should give a talk about that. People would be interested. Try it. And somehow, I don't even know how, because I am... Uh, I do have stage fright, <laughs> absolutely. And he convinced me, he said, you should, you should give a talk. And I decided to go and give a talk. And I give a talk about um, Perl and Android. I didn't know anyone in TPF, so while I had the Android robot, I didn't ask for permission to use the Onion, and it felt bad. And I was very embarrassed to talk to anyone in TPF that now I know personally uh, fantastic people. Um, so I decided to take a royalty-free picture of an Onion. Now, for the robot, I put a bunch of hearts. For the onion, I put a bunch of twizzles, because, you know, pearl. So I, I dug up the picture. And that was, that was my talk. Um, that was the entire slide for my talk. And um, I, I was really, 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 a little bit scared when I gave the talk. Um, I think my saving grace was this picture of a cat that was really sad that he had to use Java to program on Android instead of Perl. Um, and I, this really is a good time to thank uh, Dotan Dimet, who um, saw me outside, walking back and forth, drinking like 30 cups of water. He took it out of my hand, said, stop drinking, go in there, <laughs> and give your talk. So I haven't forgotten this. I also got to um, help commit election fraud. <laughs> and it, oh, I'm sorry, that's not... Not the right picture, there we go. Um, so I got to help commit election fraud. It was actually a writing competition. And um, they, they allowed voting, and they basically said, you need to send a request where the request contained who you are, your ID, as a voter, and who you were voting for. That was it. Um, there was no cookies. Uh, there were no cookies involved. There was no authentication. There was no authorization key. And I don't know how many see a problem with this. I'll give you one more hint. Um, the, the numbers, you're saying, well, okay, but you, each person's uh, number is, is random, and it's a hash, and fine, and, well, it's not encrypted, but still. But the numbers of the voters were sequential. <laughs> and if you create a new user, you got 1,013 or 14. And you had 1,013 people before you, which you could send. So we just said, well, I'm number 732. I'd like to vote for 12. Okay. I'm number 700, I'd like to vote for nine. Okay. So basically we voted for random people by random people. <laughs> I'd like to think of it as, you know, increasing entropy in the name of scientific research. <laughs> now, I am not sharing all these stupid little stories because I want you to think I'm cool. You should already think that way because I am. But in all seriousness, we all have these stories. These stories show us where we come from. And they remind us of how much joy we find in what we do. And we look back at all of these stories to guide us in our future endeavors, hoping that we would approach them in the same way that we approached all of these stories, all of these cases and experiences, with that, that curiosity with that eagerness to discover an unrelenting joy in the process and the result, even when we fail. Which leads me to asking you about your job. What do you do when someone asks you, what do you do? Well, I can share my answers. I actually have two. One of them is one that you probably use yourself. It is, I work with computers. Right? Yeah, it's... Mm. But the thing is, I don't give any, everyone that answer. I only give two uh, types of people that answer. One, people I don't have, uh, with which I don't have the time to go into this. But the other one is people I don't want to go into this. Like, say, for example, a French customs agent frisking me on my way to a hackathon in Paris because from Amsterdam, thinking that my, jump, uh, my gym bag full of clothes is actually, I'm, I'm trying to sneak in drugs. Just for example, <laughs> theoretically. Not that I would know, goddamn hackathon. Um, but my second answer is probably, possibly more interesting. I tell people that I solve puzzles for a living. They're like, what? And I say, yeah, I solve puzzles for a living. And you know what? I actually get extra points if I find an elegant solution to those puzzles. And that's, I, I find that very cool because, you know, th this, this really is what we do. 
we solve problems. We take the fabric of life and we change it. We take reality and we shape it. See, this is our profession. Whether we get paid for it or not, this is our labor. But the thing is that we kind of, we grow up with time. And growing up is something I've noticed we try to do while not doing. We want to grow up, but we don't really want to grow up. Because sometimes when you grow up, you don't approach problems with that same mindset. You don't approach them with that curiosity, with that fun, seeking like the cool way of doing this and the fun way of doing this. And I'm gonna give a few examples. The first one, I'm going to use React. How many people here, by show of hands, know what React is? I'm not, I don't care about the answer, I wanna know the numbers. Thank you. Um, so that's quite a few. React is a key value storage. For the people who raise their hands, do you know what language React is written in? Very few. Now, it is written in Erlang, a language that I think, uh, one Erlang user, not bad. More than usual, I should say. Now, Erlang is actually a language that I think has some things in common with, uh, with Perl because it, is, it has more history. People think that because the syntax is a bit funky that you can't do really, really, really cool things with it. And, um, you know, the users are sometimes a bit quiet. But for those who would raise their hand, like, I know it's React. Okay, what version? What, what version of Erlang? It, it, there are versions, right? No one. And, you know, if you know the version, do you know what kind of services React comes with? What kind of dependencies it has, the libraries? I don't know if you know this. Most people don't. In fact, if you're not a crazy sysadmin, you definitely don't. And the nice thing is that this is on purpose. See, React is provided just like uh, Basho intends, as a full-on solution. It's a package that you install and you get everything with it. You get the application itself, you get the interpreter, you get the libraries, the init scripts, the configuration files, you get everything bundled together. It's ready for use as is. They don't ask you whether you're okay with using Erlang for React. There is no discussion here. They don't ask you if that version of Erlang is fine with you. They don't tell you, we're going to bring in this library. Are you okay with this? They don't ask you if that specific version of the library is okay. And that is, I think, a very important distinction. They provide you with a solution. If they want to upgrade Erlang, what they do is release a new version of React that will include an up-to-date Erlang. That's it. Now, if we were driven by our sense of enjoyment, we would solve our problems in Perl and provide them as working solutions. But to do this, uh, we would need to bundle Perl. And I, I foresee a few problems. For example, we would need a way to define dependencies. Uh, if we could define them, maybe in a file that is, kinda has like that CPAN structure, like a CPAN file, or if it could be in some distribution, like a, you know, like a, like a Godzilla, of distribution managers, maybe a scanner for prerequisites. But this is the thing, we actually have those, a uh, prereq scanner and distzilla and, you know, we have all of those. Well, maybe we need an installer, kind of like, kind of like CPAN, not, not something big, something small, like a minus size. Kind of like maybe, I would call it CPAN minus, I don't know about you. So, okay, yeah, we have that, that's fine. But, of course, we would need a way to load all of our libraries locally. So, we would need a local directory, like a, a, a local library, you know, a local lib. If we could only have a local, uh, I wonder if anyone took that, that um, namespace, local lib. So, yeah, we have that. But, yeah, yeah, one thing I forget is that we would need to compile Perl. So, you know, a way to build our own Perl, like a, like a, like a, a way to brew it, like a, like a Perl brew, right? Or, or a, a builder, like a Perl build script thing, right? Or like our own environment of, of Perl, like, a, like a, our own Perl in env, our PL env, I don't know. Maybe we could have all of these. But now they realize we actually do have all of these. We have all of it, the entire stack. We're missing one thing. We need to glue those together. And this is my question now. Does anyone know a good glue language? <laughs> so 
the thing is that someone actually did this. So Kang Min Gu God, he's actually here. Feel free to, to get him some beverage of his choice or some beverage of someone else's choice. Surprise him. Who knows? Um, he wrote Seacan. And he wrote it within two days of me suggesting this idea. So he does deserve some credit for it. Quite a bit. Yes, you can. Which leads me to another problem that we have. When we talk about marketing and we talk about sharing what we have and what we enjoy, you know, why not share? We have some cool stuff. Does anyone know what this is? Right. Who knows this is an echo chamber? You can raise your hands. This is great. You guys need to stop raising your hands. It's not an echo chamber. <laughs> this is actually something called an, an, an echo chamber. The only person to get it right was actually Larry, <laughs> who yelled it out. <laughs> and an echo chamber, and don't blame me, this is not my language, um, and an echo chamber does the opposite of an echo chamber. While an echo chamber bounces off sound, and an echo chamber swallows sound. There is no sound in an echoic chamber. It can make you go nuts, literally. And you see, we talk a lot about having an echo chamber, but what I think is that we don't have an echo chamber. We have an echoic chamber. And what I'm gonna try and do is convince you that we need an echo chamber. There is no echo chamber, and I wish we didn't have one. Let's try to build one. You see, in an echo chamber, because sound bounces off everything, everyone gets to hear it. But Somehow, in our community, when cool things come up, not everyone hear it. In Ruby, if someone invents the same piece of shit for the first, you know, fifth million time, they all hear about it. They all talk about it. You know, Node will invent the same thing that Java and Python and Ruby and Pro will look from the side and go like, yeah, we actually already have it. And uh, we also did it better. Um, but they all talk about it. They all talk about it. And people think, well, I'm not an early adopter. That's okay. Early adopters are a very small percentage, about six by my made-up calculation. And um, you don't need to be an early adopter. You need to be someone who shares. And eventually, it will hit an early adopter. And they will improve it to a point that if you want to use it and need to use it in the future, you'll get it. So I think we should start sharing what we have. We have shiny toys. When we have cool things, we should talk about it. And this is a really good opportunity. It could be your coworkers, it could be your Twitter, it could be your LinkedIn, it could be your Facebook, it could be your Promongers meeting. Not everyone that follows you on Twitter is a Pearl developer. And not everyone in your workplace is a Pearl developer. But if you share it with them, it will eventually lead to all Pearl developers. And if all Pearl developers share, you'll reach people who are not Pearl developers. It will actually Bounce off the echo chamber and like pinpoint holes, it will pass through it and go to the bigger echo chamber, to other languages. I'll give you an example for something interesting. JavaScript has something, uh, well, they're working on something called observers. Um, and uh, JavaScript observers, here's the thing. It works like this. You change a variable and a, and a function gets called, okay? So if you're playing with a hash and you're modifying it, some function will get called. If you're putting something or removing something from an array, some function will get called. And someone call, told me about this. I was like, wow, this is, this is, this is uh, tied, tied variables. <laughs> we have this. We, we had it for a really long time. We don't even like it. <laughs> now, I'm not saying you should use tied variables. What I am saying is that they all know about it. And now I know about it. And I'm not a JavaScript developer. But they talk about it so much that people outside of the JavaScript community hear about it. So what I think is this. Not just strict, not just DBI, who, that, that are probably the only things I can think of that if you're programming in Perl for more than two minutes, someone had already told you about this. We should have an echo chamber. And in our echo chamber, we will talk to each other about every cool thing that we saw and that we did. And, you know, we could build a really good echo chamber. We could, we could build one, you know, it would be kind of like Ruby, but it won't have any rock star bullshit. It could be like Python, but we won't have any arrogance and pretentiousness. Oh, at best, it could be like Node.js, but without any fucking hipsters. And they will be the best five. 
So I'm going to help you, starting with Develle Declare, to introduce you to some crazy shit that we have. Now, this is not to necessarily get you to start using them, but to get you to start sharing them with your coworkers and your friends and your fellow pro developers. These are things and pro these are projects that I think all of us should actually know whether we use them or not. First of all, Develle Declare. Develle Declare is, and I'm going to try and explain it, it basically allows you to parse Perl in Perl without Perl while running in Perl. This might be confusing, but that's because it is. See, um, you can actually say, uh, excuse me, Perl interpreter, could you step aside? I would like to parse this. But I'm actually going to write parsing code in Perl, so please parse my code that will parse this code so you don't parse it, but then I will provide you with what you need to parse while after you finish parsing mine. Then you parse that, and then you can run it. And this is all in runtime. Okay, this is crazy. This basically means that the sky is no longer the limit. We obliterated the sky, that's it. And it's batshit insane. So you shouldn't use this. You should use the Velcro parser, which is smarter and better. <laughs> but this basically means that you can now, in Pro, parse any kind of syntax. You want Ruby syntax? Implement it, and you don't have to write another interpreter. You just have to set the parsing. Devel NYT Prof, fantastic profiler. You profile your code, you understand it, you optimize it. I would like a thank you to Tim Bunce for doing it. Next one is develop, declare, uh, develop cover, there we go. And develop cover is a really good way to check the testing coverage of your code. So you can see how many of the execution paths you actually gone through, which is very, very helpful. I want to say thank you to Paul for writing this. <laughs> data printer is my favorite thing in the world. If I could marry a Perl module, it would be data printer. <laughs> and if I could have a three-person wedding, it would be with Guru who wrote it. Basically, data printer should be in every Perl developer's toolkit. It allows you to print out your code very quickly, colored, sorted, introspectable. It is incredible. Start using this shit, okay? And Garu, thank you. <laughs> On to Moose. Not everyone know about Moose. Now, the hands that go up when people ask, do you know about it, are slowly dwindling. And I'm hoping it's not because people now feel uncomfortable saying it, but because they started hearing about it more. I'm, I actually don't have any qualms with anyone who doesn't know Moose. My problem is people who know about Moose and don't share it with others. It doesn't mean they have to use it, but tell them about it so they know. JavaScript people saw this and they imported it and ported it to Juice. So, and I think there's even another one that implements it in JavaScript. It's, it's, it's insane. It's, it's fantastic. Basically, what Moose said was, let's take a look at every other language that did um, object-oriented, except PHP, <laughs> and see how they did it. Take the best implementations from each one, and nothing from PHP, and, and make it, you know, sensible. And that's why we have an object system which is better than every other language because they took from every other language that did it right. And they only took the good parts, which is fantastic. It's incredible. And uh, you know what? I want to thank Steven, who started it. And I want to thank, thank the entire Moose team, who still maintain it actively all the time. Thank you. Of course, we have DBX class. I'm going to start picking up the pace because otherwise I think uh, Jeff is going to start throwing shit at me. Um, so DBX class, this is not just an ORM. It is a very, very smart ORM. It is incredible. Reba Sushi did insane stuff with it to get it so optimized and so featureful that this is, this is a competition to ORMs. This is not a competition to Perl ORMs. You can make this compete with a lot of other ORMs. So, you know, we, we don't actually talk a lot about it. Um, I mean, Reba talks about it, and we understand at least 10% of what he says. <laughs> so we should talk about it. And I want to thank Matt, who wrote it. I want to thank Reba Sushi, who maintains it so diligently and does such an amazing job. Thank you. <laughs> PSGI and Plaque is probably one of the most amazing things that we got. 
And what it does is separate completely the application from the server. So you can run every application on any web server. And it is amazing. And that led to all of these frameworks being written and a bunch of servers being written and a bunch of other frameworks being written. And they're still actively maintained, and great things are happening with this. And uh, they're all amazing in their own way, and you should check them out and try them out and, and play with them and share them. And Miyagawa deserves a huge applause for all of this. <laughs> when we talk about having our own Perl, uh, Localib, Carton, and Pinto. These are three different projects that allow you to have your own copy of modules that you don't care about your system setup. You know what? Fuck system Perl. A lot of languages are not system languages, so they don't care. They have their own versions. They just set up the latest one. But we're kind of stuck on, on you know, our own Perl being system Perl. And these libraries, along with these ones, are different ways to allow us to have our own Perl completely separate with our own module directory, everything. And this is incredible. This is amazing. We can tell system Perl to fuck off. We can tell our sysadmin that we have an, our own Perl and we will maintain whatever we want with it and we will ship it and use it. And then we have everything else. And the people who were involved with this, and I do want to uh, name them Miyagawa and Jeff Thalhammer and um, Pearl Brew, uh, I'm going to butcher the name, so I'm actually going to apologize and not say them, other than Gugod uh, Kangmin, who's up there, and it took me a while to learn his name, I'm sorry. On to Serial, which is a fantastic serialization format. It is very, very, very performant. If you're using Storable, stop. Pick this up instead. This was written by the smartest people that we have, which are actually really, really, really smart. There are some really crazy people in the Pearl community. Uh, Eve Orton, Stefan Mueller, Damien Griski, um, Nick Perez, they deserve an applause for this, and you should check it out and start using it. Thank you. <laughs> Rick, RJBS. Uh, while I'm at it, Miyagawa, Rick says, yo. So, uh, Rick Cygnus wrote Diesel, this Dilla that allows you to release modules like this all the time, 10 times a day as much as you want, everything in plugins, you don't have to do any of it. And uh, this is incredible. If you're writing modules, check this out. This is really, 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 really cool. Signatures, they are in. Thank you, Peter Martini. Can I get an amen for signatures? <laughs> That's it, they're in. The man crawled through, gr through glass in the desert. He got them in. Of course, the mop in Access and C, Hopefully, we'll go either in core or somewhere in long core. And oh, this is, god damn it, Steven. So, thank you, Steven. And yeah, so all these are really, 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 really great things. And I want you to check them out. I want you to share them with your uh, friends. I want you to share them with your coworkers. Now, I want to make one last note. This is something that Jeremy Carmen wrote before EAPS CNA. He said, one of the uh, great things about going to a conference where everyone is excited about the same thing is that excitement is contagious. And what I would like to do is bring you back to the beginning of this, to my stories, to your stories, to what brought you here. I want you to look around you. EAPS is the essence of that feeling. We come here to see each other, to get excited about what we do, and to be reminded of why we do this, whether we get paid for it or not. I want you to approach your next problem, your next puzzle, your next riddle, with that same curiosity, with that same eagerness to learn, with that same love, that same joy, and the same way that you approached Yapsi, the way that you approached all of those stories. Because you see, all of our stories, all of the modules that we use, the applications that, that we run, the shit that I rant about all the time, uh, Yapsi itself, the people you met, the conversations you've had, the talks you attended, the social me uh, meetings and, and events you took part in, all of these things, all of them and where we are right now in this exact moment in time. This is the joy in what we do.
treasure it, and never forget it. Thank you.